Welcome to the Wealth Planning for the Modern Physician podcast, where we talk to doctors like you about their real world lessons in financial matters and hear from industry experts who can impact your personal bottom line. The host of our podcast is David Mandel. David is an attorney, OJM Group partner, and author of more than a dozen books on wealth planning for physicians. You can find additional audio episodes from our first four seasons on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and other popular platforms. Now, let's turn the mic over to David. Hello, this is David Mandel, host of the podcast. Uh, Thanks for joining us either on the audio platforms or you're watching me on YouTube. And for those of you longtime listeners, uh, I'll remind you again, we are on YouTube now. So if you feel like you need to see my face to get more information or to appreciate this more, you can go to YouTube. Uh, We have the links in the show notes. So I'm excited about today's um, podcast uh, episode. We've got two CPAs who uh, work with a lot of medical dental uh, practices who I think can give some interesting insights in how to run a a private practice or, you know, probably applicable to even uh, uh, another small business if you might have one. So let me tell you, uh, give you their bios and then uh, we'll bring them on. Uh, Mary Catherine Williamson, CPA, is a tax partner with Aprio's National Dental Services Practice. She has dedicated the past decade to serving dental practices and growing Aprio's Dental Group, specializing in forward-focused tax planning and helping clients, clients grow, start, or buy dental practices. Uh, the dental benchmarking, financial analysis, and corporate income tax planning and strategies that uh, Mary Catherine provides help dentists thrive through the life cycle of their practice. She earned both her BBA and master's in accounting degrees from Georgia Southern University. Chelsea Dorfeld is a CPA and a senior tax manager at Aprio's Professional Services Group. She specializes in healthcare in helping healthcare clients grow their practices while minimizing their tax liabilities with thorough tax planning year-round. She has extensive experience in working with S corporations and partnerships within the professional service world, particular in the healthcare niche. So with that, Mary Catherine, Chelsea, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's good to have you. And, you know, for those of you listening to those bios, you know, they're both from the same firm, Aprio, and Aprio happens to be uh, a very large um, uh, CPA firm, does a lot of things, uh, and they have, uh, I think their main office is still in, in Atlanta. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So we, you, we at OJM have had a relationship with a couple of the partners there for 10, 12 years. We wrote a book for Georgia physicians with them um, about 10, 12 years ago. And um, uh, now we're talking to the next generation of CPAs uh, on this call. So, um, but uh, we've known them for a long time. And Aprio is the firm. We'll put the, obviously, the, the, uh, a uh, link to the website in the uh, show notes. So uh, first, before we get into the topic today, which is know your numbers, um, Chelsea uh, and then uh, Mary Catherine, let's talk about uh, each of you. Just give us a little background beyond the bio, you know, just, you know, what have you done over your career? Where are you from? You know, what's your favorite food? That kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for having us, David. I know we're both really excited to be here. Um, I've grown up in Georgia my whole life. Um, grew up in Alpharetta, went to GA, came back and currently live in East Cobb. I actually started at Aprio um, 10 years ago as an intern with Mary Catherine um, and, you know, came back and have, as a full-time staff and have been here since. So um, Aprio really helped me grow my career from start to now. Um, I worked originally in like professional services um, and in the past couple years have began um, begun to focus on healthcare clients. Um, and while we do handle taxes for our clients, we really like to build the relationships with the clients to become more of an advisor um, and help them grow and build their practices however, however we can. Got it. So, you know, one of the things you mentioned there, and, and Mary Catherine probably will too, is is helping clients grow beyond just doing the tax returns. You made that point right there. You know, we don't just do tax returns. And we talk about that a lot. Um, Like when I'm giving lectures, you know, I say, you know, to an audience of physicians, what have you, and I say, you know, how many people get proactive, forward-looking advice versus tax preparation, which is looking backwards, right? It's right now we're recording this in February. 
I'm sure you're getting 1099s and you're looking at all this stuff for clients to describe what happened in 2023. Right. And mm-hmm. obviously, if you have expertise, you can do a great job at that. But there's only so many things you can do when you're looking backwards, right? Versus right. looking forwards and saying, hey, we could actually do things differently in the future. So I just wanted to call that out because you made that point. Yeah. Um, Mary Catherine, let's hear about you. Yes, uh, just like Chelsea said, thank you. My my background will be very similar to Chelsea. I was so glad yeah. she said that she and I interned together. So Chelsea yeah. and I have been at APRA the same amount of time. So we're coming up on our 10th year intern together. Um, so my background, I have lived in Georgia my whole life too. Grew up in a small town called Milledgeville, Georgia. Um, a college there is Georgia College and State University. Went to Georgia Southern, like you said, my bio for my undergrad and master's. And then just like Chelsea, interned here and then came back full time in 2014. So my whole time at APRO, tax is my background. I am a CPA. I've always worked in the professional services world. So yes, my clients have always been the service-based clients. Um, but as I've grown in my career, they have progressed more and more into the healthcare space. I mean, granted, I've always worked in the healthcare space, but then within the past four years, I became very dental specific. So I am a partner on our dental team and the bulk of my clients I work with on a daily basis are dental practices and the owners. Um, but as we get into the conversation today, a lot of what I do and what Chelsea does, they 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 mix. Uh, a lot of the numbers and just themes are very similar across the the medical field. Um, and so yeah, that's that's where I've ended up today. And, and kind of just like tagging on to your last comment of that is how we like to operate at Aprio. Tax is a given. It is compliance. You have to file a tax return. But really, where we think we come in as the true value providers are. The, the the value add conversations of, hey, where are your numbers? Do you know your numbers? That, that's the type of conversations that we enjoy having. Granted, yes, they feed into a tax return at the end of the day, but that, it's just like you said, that proactive thinking, the proactive conversations, I feel like is what sets us apart at Aprio. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, and I think that's what the people listening here uh, are looking for. Uh, certainly always looking to save taxes. We know that. But also, uh, how to run their practice more efficiently and more profitably, et cetera. So, um, okay, let's start, Chelsea, with you, the first couple questions. So the title of this episode is Know Your Numbers. So uh, that kind of begs the question, which numbers? Uh, what are we What are we talking about here and which numbers, m- you know, m- mean the most or is most important? Yeah, yeah. Um- so that's it, it depends, right? So it depends on your specialty. Every every specialty has a different set of numbers that matter, but there are the big ones that matter for almost all businesses, healthcare, dental, and all service businesses. Um, that would be labor, supplies, occupancy, labs, you know, just to name a couple off the top of my head. Um, but really when we say knowing your numbers, it's more about like knowing your financials. Are your financials accurate? Do they accurately represent what's going on in the business? Um, you know, do they, you know, are the big categories of expenses, the big buckets of expenses, are they right? Like, are you know, are we looking at accurate buckets? Um, that will help us determine, you know, what practice KPIs look like for your industry and what, what that means, what specialty KPIs can we compare it to, um, you know, other practices of your size, other practices, you know, in the same life cycle of your business. Um, so when we say know your numbers, it's kind of all of them, but definitely the bigger ticket buckets that we that we look at really matter. And, and again, you know, labor, supplies, you know, rent, et cetera. So a couple of questions there. You mentioned mm-hmm. KPI. Can you just tell people what that means in case they don't know? Yeah, so that's a key performance indicator, and it's like um, it's a percentage of income or percentage of gross profit um, per your business, and, and we can kind of compare that across the board. So if we're looking, you know, I'm thinking, you know, if I was a physician uh, in a practice, uh, whether I'm one of, you know, five partners or 10 partners or solo, I, I would think that some of the key numbers for me would be, well, obviously for all businesses, revenues. So meaning... How many patients am I seeing? Um, you know, how much revenue per patient? Meaning, you know, again, you know, uh, it's different in medicine. Obviously, we're trying to treat the patient and not just uh, uh, increase revenues. But get an idea of what that is. Um, also, um, collection time. Um, you know, meaning um, how long the accounts receivable are out there and percentage of collections. Meaning, how much am I collecting of those? Um, 
Is that some of the key numbers you generally look at, Mary? Catherine, maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, so it, it's really similar to what Chelsea said. So obviously speaking more on the dental niche side um, of, of numbers, but really it goes to, it's just like she said, of just making sure you know where your cash is going. At the end of the day, I think it's the same for any doctor that owns their own practice is, hey, at the end of the day, what is my cash flow? That is what I have seen over my career it has been is the most important item for them. And so a lot, a lot of the conversations I've had of like, hey, my cash says, or my overall net income says this at the end of the year or on a quarterly basis or whatever that we're talking about. And they're like, but I, where's my cash going? And I think that just kind of feeds into, okay, well, this is where proactive planning needs to come into play. You actually need to know those numbers because, and then we're going to get into this in one of the conversations or one of the questions, but you know, at the end of the day, we're in 2024 and staff staffing costs have, have risen across the board since COVID. So, at, you know, do does the practice owner know how much they're spending and staffing? How about your your rent, your lease agreement? I mean, is it coming up for renewal? Are you working with an attorney or a, a broker to renegotiate your lease? Do you know how much you're spending on an annual um, a basis in rent? And obviously, as that increases each year. And just like Chelsea said, I mean, whether you're in dental or a, another medical field, I mean, your supplies and your labs with rising costs cost across the board, those are also increasing as well. So I think it's just getting a, a grip on those, your operating expenses, the expenses that are given and that are necessary and ordinary for you to keep your practice doors open. I think that's what's most important for you to actually see it in those main categories, which, you know, a topic for another day, another discussion of what does your accounting function look like and who's managing that? Because that's how you can, you know, easily analyze and evaluate the health of your practice by knowing these numbers. So it's, you know, you were, uh, both of you kind of, and this is a good thing, probably what I would want for my CPA is you were focusing a lot on the expenses side of what the, uh, both of you were talking about labor, rent, et cetera. I was bringing up revenue side, mm -hmm. being an entrepreneur, I'm a positive person thinking about growing my business. So I'm thinking about revenues, but, um, both of those pieces are equally important. And my guess is in, um, and this sort of relates to the next question, which is, I'm going to ask it in, in the context. So, you know, what would you say it means in financial terms to be a healthy practice? What do you want to see? And then the other correl you know, correlate question to that, which I'm thinking is, do you get the question sometimes, hey, my practice seems to be growing, but I'm not making any more money. Uh, you know, why? What's going on? So if you can talk about healthy practice and also that question practice is growing, but I'm not making any more, not taking home anymore. Um, you can answer kind of the, both of those, comment on both of those concepts. Yeah, of course. Um, so things that we look for to be a healthy practice, you know, having a good cash flow, having cash reserves on hand, you know, not dipping too much into that line of credit, um, having good receivables coming to you, you know, having the timing come in correctly. Um, you know, the numbers tell a story. And so we want to follow that story, right? Like, does it make sense for the life cycle of the business that you're in to have the numbers that you have? So, you know, at the beginning of a practice advertising, for example, maybe 10 to 15% of revenue. Um, by the time, you know, you're in a mature stage of the business, that may be down to less than 2%. So does, does the business story tell the accurate story? Is it correct? Um, you know, you asked about why a doctor may not be making any more money, like have costs risen? Are there, you know, expenses we can renegotiate? Can we work with a new supplier? Can we renegotiate that lease? Like Mary Catherine mentioned, um, I mean, costs are rising across the board, like <laughs> staffing is outrageous. Supplies are outrageous. You know, even billing fees have increased. So looking, um, you know, looking at the full picture can kind of give us an, an idea. And that kind of goes back to knowing those numbers, right? Like, are those accurately reflected in your financials? And, and if so, then let's tell the story and understand why you're not making more, um, even though the practice is growing. Because um, typically something will fall out when we, you know, when we take a peek. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. And the next question, I'm going to get to Mary Catherine, you can uh, answer some of if you want, if you had comments on what she said, but we're going to talk about uh, uh, cost items. Uh, a couple of thoughts here, and this, I, I should have probably should have brought this up at the beginning. Um, but, um, uh, there's, you know, I can, I think I can remember this from business school. It's been a long, long time, but 
basically there's a concept, which is you can't manage what you don't measure, right? So if you don't know the numbers first, there's no way you can manage your business properly because you don't know that. Now, every doc listening to this, whether it's dentistry or veterinarian or medical or surgical, et cetera, understands that from a medical context, right? You have to get the blood work. You have to get the, the, uh, um, you know, the uh, uh, MRI or the x-ray, et cetera, before you just start to treat somebody, you got to understand what you're dealing with and and diagnose it. And that's, I think, the same thing what we're talking about here financially. So, you know, knowing your numbers is, you know, measuring what, where you're at, because then you can make decisions proactively and manage it. But if you don't know the numbers first, then you just, you know, shot in the dark. You have no idea whether it's going to help. Um, you also talk both of you about renegotiating a lease, and that might be something, Mary Catherine, you're going to talk about next in terms of overhead items. But um, I do want to direct the uh, listeners and viewers to another episode earlier in the season. I had Colin Carr on, I think it was number two this season, and he's a um, real estate agent who all he does is uh, represent physician uh, practices. And some really interesting. Uh, a conversation there about how to approach renegotiation of a lease, whether to buy or lease, uh, when to reach out to the landlord, how to, and all the kind of major m- mistakes that most uh, docs and practices make when it comes to their real estate. Um, uh, he digs in, we go pretty deep there. So uh, if you're interested in that topic, I want you to go back and listen to that one because you'll get a lot out of it. So, um, all right, Mary Catherine, let's go to uh, overhead items. Talk to us about that. Sure. So the, the the highest that I've seen across the board, and I honestly think this relates to any industry, we don't have to just be talking about medical here, is staffing. I mean, granted, we are in 2024, Chelsea and I see it across the board, just like in our profession, just rising costs when it comes to staffing. So a couple of things here. So, you know, just speaking on the dental side of just like specific things I've seen recently, which is crazy, which I think you can relate to medical, you know, whatever type of practice you are. But like, granted, let's just talk about a general dental practice. A hygienist right now can walk in and ask for $50 an hour, which two or three years ago, that was 35. So that is a huge jump that has really, really, really affected majority of my practices. Like this is the highest cost item that we are, we constantly have to talk about and just say, you know, it is a constant conversation right now, just as we're just in this era of rising costs. Um, but then also um, the, the cost of turnover. So because, and there's another point I'll get to this as well, but um, it, it also has to do with, I think, a generational thing, which, you know, not want to get into the weeds of this, but the generation that's entering our workforce just has just has that authority for some reason to say, hey, I, I can ask for what I want and I'm going to get it. If not, I'm going to walk down the road and go to the next shop that'll give it to me. And so because of that, it's it's causing huge turnover, which at the end of the day, I don't know if practice owners have noticed this, but turnover is extremely costly because you're constantly having to retrain someone and you don't understand the cost and the resources that are going into retraining. Um, that is just making that overall bucket of your your expenses and your financials that we keep talking about of knowing your numbers, you know, that's it's gonna throw you out of whack when you want to look at how profitable you are. Um, so staffing it has been the biggest right now so far. Um, and then also, you know, just in on the medical side, just doctors in general, your supplies and your labs are gonna be very big costs for you. And you want to make sure you're managing those, uh, like Chelsea said, with whatever vendors or suppliers or lab companies. I mean, some dental practices are starting to actually, you know, create their own lab company to save some costs. So, I mean, I think that's where you can start getting into with this proactive planning and looking at your financials of like, hey, what are some things that I can start investing in my own practice and bringing things internally to save costs? So I would say the things that I've seen the biggest across the board, obviously, is staffing just in the medical world in general. I mean, depending on the type of uh, doctor you are, supplies and labs are always going to be really big. Um, And then for those that do rent, so do not own their own space. I mean, if you're not watching your lease or, you know, really pay attention to those numbers, then obviously your rent, and depending on where you are across the country, um, that really comes into play as well. So, yeah, I want to just call out, you you mentioned um, turnover and the cost of that. And again, you know, part of my job here, I think, is to let the listeners and viewers know other resources they can go to to dig deeper in this. So 
Um, you know, just this season, it, I, it, depending on when this comes out, because we don't always know when we record it, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that we'll have already had a episode from Dr. Neil, who's an optometrist who had so many problems with hiring mm -hmm. and turnover that he actually dedicated uh, a lot of time and resources to go down a rabbit hole and develop a interviewing um, and hiring process that worked for his practice well enough that he now uh, brings this to other physician practices and dental practices and ophthalmology practices. Because, you know, the, the front desk person, whether they're at cardiology office or, you know, a dermatology office um, or an ophthalmology or optometrist kind of has the same role. Mm -hmm. And so he has developed a, um, uh, a system for that. And I think, again, people interested in that topic should listen to that or watch that episode because some interesting insights there. And then a couple of seasons ago, um, I had Frank Maselli on and Frank actually came to our firm. And one of the things that he uh, does is he uses this uh, Colby A personality test and sees like what your skills are truly um what your kind of innate personality is like and it was pretty interesting in our firm uh we had a lot of people who kind of were in the same um uh same sort of testing range and then a couple who weren't um but it's un important to and i think there's a lot of evidence based on these tests that um the kind of people that will do things the way you hope to do if you're the owner and that will get along with other people um, that goes, you know, that doesn't show up on a resume, right? I mean, this is not stuff that's, you know, experience. It's not where you went to school. It's not your favorite color or your hobbies. It's kind of a, more, a little more deep than that. So those are two episodes I think people should uh, uh, check out if they want to go a little deeper on cost of overhead or at least potentially ways to um, mitigate that cost by being a little high, uh, smarter with hiring. Um, okay. A couple more questions, uh, Mary Catherine for you, and then we'll go back to Chelsea. So, you know, and these two questions are really, um, geared towards those listeners or viewers who are in a practice area where they have some control of their own fees. So, you know, you've got, all the folks I know who are listening are plastics and derms and med spas and dentists to, to some degree. And obviously that's where Mary Catherine focuses. Um, it's not probably going to be applicable to those who are, you know, kind of uh, completely inside of and restrained by the insurance world, Medicare and private insurers, because obviously that's a whole nother topic that we've spent. And we have a lot of other speakers or guests who've been on to talk about that, but you can't just raise your fees uh, without talking to the insurers in a lot of areas of medicine. Given that, um, for those listeners and, and viewers who are in those spaces, you know, because of some of these rising costs, you know, what do you advise practices on raising fees um, or potentially if they're in a place where they have both insurance and fee for service. Um, and obviously in the dental world, that, that's where you're coming from primarily. There may be a lot of dentists, but there's also, you know, dermatology, you know, who does medical and they do cosmetic, many of them, right? And in uh, some other specialties as well. So how do you advise clients on that? And what considerations do you look at to help them to decide, yeah, let's, we think it would be a good idea to uh, raise fees, or I, it may, maybe it would be a good idea to really start focusing on fee for service and start cutting on the insurance side. Right. So I'll take it in two parts. So fee for service, which granted the practices that I work with that are fee for service and that, that made that switch, it's been very beneficial. But like you said, you have to be prepared for it and know that you can do it. But just in terms of just raising fees, if you are fee for service, there should be no reason that you don't raise your fees every single year because you have that control. 
Um, just like us uh, on the on the the CPA side, we have to raise our fees every single year. I mean, it's just like it kind of just goes with our theme. There's costs rising right now, so you know it just kind of feeds into it. So that's something that I constantly have to remind my practice owners of, like, hey, you know, you you can raise your fees, um, but also at the same on the same hand know where you are in terms of fees. Uh, a fee analysis is, is something that I love to suggest and will refer to a consultant to have this done just to know, you know, get a baseline of where you are. It's very hard to go above that 90th percentile of overall fees. Um, and granted, it, it's almost like low hanging fruit for a lot of consultants because practice owners just don't really think to take the time to get this done and then actually see where they are measuring up against other practices. I mean, this is, this goes across the, the board for all medical practices is like knowing your baseline also for where your fees are. I think that's a very important theme and concept to just take away. Um, and so if you haven't gotten a fee analysis done, that's something you should at least be getting every two years. Um, so then for our fee for service clients, you know, raising fees every single year, whether it's 2% to 5%, I mean, that's really the range that I've seen right now. Um, but then our insurance provider uh, clients, I mean, it, it is hard, but I think with insurances, Fee negotiations, which is also something that uh, consultants can help you with as well, of also knowing where your fees are and knowing who your lowest paying payers are. That is something that I think is a task in itself, but once done correctly and actually, you know, identifying those low, low payers, go ahead and get rid of them. There's no point of having all the effort and resources to try to track down all of those collections because that really throws you out of whack of thinking of, hey, look at my production report. I should be collecting this, but because of these low payers, then obviously it's it's throwing some um it's some discrepancy between the two. And obviously you want them as close as you possibly can. Um, obviously knowing it's not possible at the end of the day with insurances, but still just trying to get as close as possible. So I think that's something that we always, you know, advise, encourage the analysis, the negotiations, but then also making that switch. Um, I'll say this again, this is where consultants really come into play. And we have a dental specific consultant that helps our, our practices with this. But just from my personal experience, it's you got to know your patient base. You have to know if you make this switch, are you going to lose half of your patients, which there goes your revenue. So I think that's something that has to be weighed. Um, you have to look at the options of by doing so. And it's so funny just because obviously I talk about this all the time and I know what fee for service is. And I took my three-year-old to his first pediatric appointment and I had to pay on the spot. And I was like, wow, that's fee for service right then and there. They got my money right up front. And I was like, in my mind, I was like, oh man, I was not prepared for that. But then thinking about it on there and I'm like, I'm, that's great. They, you know, they collected at the date and they're not having to track down insurances to collect, you know, for a pediatric dental appointment. So um, kind of my, my two cents and my takeaways on, you know, raising fees, insurances, um, making the switch, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's great. Uh, a lot of thoughts there. I was writing down. I, I think it's really um, it gets back to you know uh, uh, managing what you can measure and understanding your fee, what you charge if you're in a fee uh, for service uh, practice, competitively mm -hmm. crucial, right? Because um, then you can see you know how much you could raise and or you know um, where you're at. Um, I also really liked your point about understanding your patient base um, and strategically, you know, um, that may allow you to do some things uh, or limit you, you know, and that, and then it says, okay, well, what can I do to change my patient base over time? Well, that is another, you know, long-term three, five year strategic plan um, that I think a lot of the docs don't think about really. Um, uh, and, and it made me think about another topic I do want to bring on that I don't scheduled yet, but concierge medicine in the uh, medical world, because there's a lot of small docs, including my brother, who have some concierge patients, but most of it is insurance and, and others jump into it full time. My actual, my old GP, he um, moved to concierge medicine and it didn't make sense really for myself because Thankfully, I've been pretty healthy, but, um, you know, when you start to have more health issues, et cetera, having that level of service is important. Yeah. But that analysis of um, of, uh, uh, of your patient base and understanding if I go from kind of traditional insurance to concierge, how many docs, how many of my patients are going right. to come over right. and how many are going to leave? 
and and I think some of these firms that that you know national firms that do concierge medicine they really have some data on that and it can help you look at your patient base and and help you make that decision. But it's all within the same theme of what we're talking about here, which is understanding your patient base and whether you raise fees or want to move from more fee base from insurance. How is your your uh, patient base going to react? And um, you got to know that before you make decisions. So I think that's a really good point. Um, Chelsea, let's go back to you. We've got a couple of questions left here because I'm always sensitive to time. And I know people need to, uh, uh, all of our docs are busy, as you know. Um, so what would you say the easiest way to increase profitability in a typical practice you see is? It's a, yeah, so there's no magic number, right? We've kind of talked about a lot of different things today. Um, collections, focusing on, you know, increasing fees, increasing collections, in decreasing collection times, that type of thing. Um, you know, knowing the buckets of expenses, knowing where your labor's at, knowing where your rent's at, um, and then kind of like picking an expense and like, all right, we're going to get this one in check. It's not going to be all of them all at once. That's just unrealistic. But like once you have, you know, a good idea of where you're at, of the current environment that, you, that you're working with, you can then pick, like, let's focus on this number. Let's Let's kind of like dial in on labor. Do we have the right amount of staffing? Do we have, you know, are we having a lot of turnover? Is our production low because we have the turnover of the docs or the nurses or whatnot? Um, focusing on one item at a time. Um, but I think, I mean, really, there's no magic answer. It's kind of like looking at all the things we've discussed today, all as a whole. Yeah. I imagine you see uh, one practice, it might be, you know, kind of stand out to you. Uh, fees or the ones might stand out to you collections or one might uh, stand yeah. out to you staffing, meaning if you do kind of the initial dashboard and you can see, okay, one, you know, uh, of these numbers is kind of way um, uh, out of whack. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. start with that, start with the yeah. low hanging fruit, the one that exactly. uh, we can get the biggest impact with. Uh, yeah. Initially. And I mean, just and having that like that outlook, right? Like we're going to set a small goal here. We're going to work towards that. And then we'll move on to the next expense. And, you know, it's setting budgets. It's saying, like, let's really focus on the supplies expense this this quarter. Right. Let's really get those supplies down. Let's make sure we're we're having the right amount. We're not getting rid of anything. There's no waste, you know, that type of thing. Um, and just going from there. So, yeah, start with the low hanging fruit and kind of just work your way up to, to the bigger ticket items. Perfect. Yeah, that makes sense. Um... Mary Catherine, you get the last question. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, one, I mean, we've talked about a bunch of takeaways, I think, today. But if there's is there another one that you'd like, you know, medical and dental practice owners to remember from our discussion, what would it be? Yeah. If there's one thing that you guys take away from guys and girls, practice owners, um, is it, this should not be a once a year conversation. Whoever you're working with, whoever your advisors are that you're working with, your CPA, your financial advisor, your consultant, this should be an ongoing conversation so that you constantly know these numbers. You constantly see how this feeds into your overall financial picture. And at the end of the day, yes, that feeds into your tax picture. But at least, you know, there are no surprises. That's something Chelsea and I are very big on that. We are a no surprises service firm. Uh, we do not like the clients that only want to work with us once a year. That, there's no value in that. Yes, I granted you understand you know, taxes are compliance, but, you know, our practice owners that we handle the accounting, we work with them in their accounting. We know their financials. They do too. We either have monthly meetings, quarterly meetings, you know, we're constantly in contact. Um, and so it's a constant conversation. So to help them better plan, help them better advise on their goals, you know, their strategies, and as they progress through their life cycle of their practice. So yes, my key takeaway is this should not just be a once a year conversation. It needs to be ongoing. So you constantly know, and everyone is on the same page, having your team all on the same page is extremely beneficial. Yeah, I, I track with that. Uh, you know, in anything that's worth managing, you can't just uh, do it once a year, right. whether it's, uh, you know, uh, your health or uh, mm -hmm. your investments, like the kind of things we work with, with clients in OJM should be regular conversations. Um, and I think even especially um, uh, in a practice with their numbers, because if you don't, um, if you don't uh, check in, uh, then you can have, you know, particularly 12 months of something that got out of control when you could have nipped it in the bud in a month or two. Mm -hmm. And you just didn't, you folks didn't know because client didn't tell you or did you didn't meet with them. And uh, worst part, uh, the worst part is when we had to find that out the hard way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In, in one of the other episodes, you know, 
uh, sort of different, but similar. It, we were talking to an attorney, um, the attorney is from Bertadato and season one. And they said, if you come to us before the problem, it's a 50 cent problem. If you come to us after the problem, it's a $50 problem. Right. And, um, you know, that is sort of the same thing, right? Meaning that if we can, the earlier we can uh, identify issues and potentially opportunities for, you know, better profitability, the better you're off you're going to be. So uh, it makes sense to me. Um, Mary Catherine, Chelsea, thanks so much for being on. Really helpful. There are some good takeaways here. Um, we really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Excellent. And to all the uh, listeners, we will put their links to their bios um, in the show notes so you can get a hold of them with uh, uh, questions if you want to uh, chat with them. And um, again, in two weeks, we'll have another episode for all of you listening and watching. Please uh, give us the uh, five stars and the review. If you're so inclined, leave us an actual review and say great things about us. Uh, that would be on the the uh, podcast platforms as well now if you're watching on youtube and uh subscribe also to either one whatever you're watching or listening to and if you're a physician or a dentist who has an interesting story and you think um there might be some good lessons for your colleagues feel free to reach out always looking to have more practitioners on as well as experts in the field so um you know how to get a hold of me just uh, shoot me an email and um i'd love to chat with you and in another two weeks, you'll have another episode. So thanks for tuning in. The Wealth Planning for the Modern Physician podcast is brought to you by OJM Group, a multidisciplinary wealth management firm dedicated to helping physicians build and preserve their wealth while reducing taxes. Podcast listeners can get a free copy of our flagship book, Wealth Planning for the Modern Physician. Simply scan the QR code or text WPPOD to 844-418-1212 to request your free print copy or ebook download. Be sure to join David for the next episode of the Wealth Planning for the Modern Physician podcast. It's important to note that this content is for informational purposes only and does not represent personalized investment advice as the information may not be suitable for your personal circumstances. Please contact your investment advisor before implementing any of the strategies discussed.